Okay, can you use assembly on leet code? Yes, yes you can. Well, inline assembly that is. They don't have the best language in the world, depending on your architecture, in this list that we can choose from. I'm not fully familiar with every language that can use inline assembly. I know Rust, for example, has, I think, recent support for inline assembly blocks. I'm not sure if it's in leet codes setup or not, but I know C works, C++ also works, but for this I'm going to do C. This is just number 20, valid parentheses. This is an easy question that I know how to solve <laughs> relatively easy with a stack or what have you. So Now using inline assembly, if you want to call other functions or make helper functions and things, you probably need to know your calling convention. So I'm going to just check what kind of setup we have here that we're you know running the code under. So if it's GCC, it should have GNU C defined as a sort of header macro here. I don't remember if it's double underscores on each side, but we'll find out. It may only be on one side or not. But we'll just see what, what shows up here. If we're using GCC or Clang or what have you. Clang, I know, is just lowercase clang. Windows, I think, is Win32. And I'll just do 32 bit. I believe it's underscore 64 for 64 bit. So I don't think that's what they run. I think they run something else. These are more platforms and not compilers, though. So I can add another one in here. If you're on a Unix platform, it should have Unix defined. I think Linux has Unix defined. But this is just to see as output what we get, and I'll just return false for all these, sure. So we'll run it, see if anything pops up. And yeah, the problem's wrong, but we got GCC and Unix running in standard out. So we know we should be able to use regular inline assembly for GCC running under a Unix host. So it's not Windows, we don't have to worry about Microsoft ABI or anything. But for a calling convention, we can do what works in GCC or Clang, and we should be all right. So that you don't think I'm cheating, I'm just going to do everything within another function here. So I'm just going to return the result of another function or, well, I'll set a bool. I'll set a variable to it. Another function I'm going to call is valid inline assembly. We're going to take in a character pointer, the same pointer, in fact, that this one's going to take in. So we'll just call it s. From, from doing this before, I had some issues with pushing too much stuff on the stack. So for this, I'll do it a little bit differently. Normally, I'd just do x86 instructions, push and pop to make it really obvious and semantic that we're using the stack, the actual processor stack. But for this, I'm going to use a separate array, sort of a separate character array, just the same size as a string to ensure we have more than enough room. And I'm just going to sort of push and pop to this string by writing to, you know, the array of characters or not. Um, to do that, I need another array. So I'm going to have character pointer. I'm just calling it T because they did S. And I'm going to C alloc this. For a string length of s, we need the number of items, we'll do 1, and we'll pass those both to this function that I have yet to do. So to do assembly, if I make sure I only want to use inline assembly, I'm going to make this a naked function, actually. So instead, like, you can do packed if you want, you know, your struct to not have padding or anything. For a function, you can use the naked attribute. We'll say it returns a boolean. This is is valid inline assembly. It takes in character pointer S and T. And what this says is basically the function prologue and epilogue that you're going to use for this function is not provided by the compiler. You have to write your own function prologue and epilogue or set up and tear down code, if you will, like moving the stack pointer into the base pointer, pushing and popping, all that stuff, using a return statement. These are things that you would have to include yourself if you want to make sure it works. The compiler will handle calling the function, it'll handle the function signature set up and everything, but the code in here really is going to be determined by you using assembly blocks and just strings in here of assembly. So that's what I'm going to be doing. So result's going to be this, and we can just return result, but I'm going to free this pointer just for, we don't have to, but it's, that's good practice to free everything that you allocate. Um, so this will be a separate string under T that's the same size as S that's allocated to all zeros. So it's easy. We can make sure it's null terminated fine. 
Uh, but for this, we're going to return result right now. It's not going to equal anything, but I can make it equal something here. So I don't like AT&T syntax for GCC and Clang, so I'm going to use Intel syntax. I don't like having prefixes and any other garbage, so we're going to say no prefix. But at the end of this, I can set it back to AT&T syntax with a prefix, just so the assembler doesn't bug out or something that maybe their setup's weird. Maybe their setup's weird on leak code or something to where it doesn't like that. Um, for these to count, multiple statements within one assembly block, I'm going to use a new line, has a, a the line separator at the end. Sometimes you can use semicolon. Semicolon usually works from what I've done, but I think more traditionally you use a new line or a new line and a tab, but it seemed to work with just the, the new line here, so I'm going to go with that. And you can use normal comments at the end of the lines. But basically, it's like regular assembly, except it's a little more tedious because you have to put it within a string and with a new line separator at the end. Other than that, it's pretty much the same assembly you know and love, hopefully. <laughs> so if we just want to return a bool, that would be a zero or one ultimately. So what I'm going to do is just move a zero or zero out uh, the accumulator. I'm assuming we're in 64-bit code that's running here. So if we get an error that, that doesn't work, we can assume we're in 32-bit but I'm just going to assume we're going to be able to do 64-bit assembly just fine. A x86, 64, that is. So I'm just going to XOR, RAX, and return and see if we get false for these results from whatever test case we're running, which I'll just use these ex the examples here. So we should have three falses because it just zeroes out and returns, and we're expecting things because I did not put a semicolon for the result. Yeah. No such instruction return dot. Yes, because return does not have a new line. So that's why you need a separator at the end of the line. I guess I meant to do that. <laughs> okay, we should get, yep, all falses. The first two should be true. That's fine. Okay, so we can write our actual code. We know that we have a basic thing working. So what are we allowed to use as far as registers? Well, for the x86 calling convention, for the System 5 AMD 64 ABI, the callee saved registers, which is what we have to worry about. I think we're down here. Yeah. If the callee wishes to use registers RBX, RSP, RBP, R12 to 15, so base register, stack, and base pointer, and R12 to 15, we have to restore values. So we could save and restore all of these by default, or just the ones that we're going to use, what have you. So even though I saved and restored the stack pointer before, I had some issues where it wouldn't fully compile. I was getting deadly signal errors for whatever reason for stack overflows somewhere even though i wasn't aware that i was using stack overflows but oh well i'm going to save clobbered registers here just in case so and that's normally done with pushing and popping <laughs> but i'm just going to do that here so rbx we'll do rsp rbp and just r12 to 15 yeah okay so 12, 13, 14, 15. And assuming the stack works all right, we'll do that when we end the program as well. I'm going to use this later. So I'm just going to put a little end label here, or end program label, end function. End is fine. We'll do that. You can use labels in here, global and local, and they work fine. You don't have to do like one and then jump one F later. Like that garbage. That's not garbage, but it's a little hard to read, and I don't like doing that usually. So we'll just say this is here for now. And pushing, you have to pop in reverse order. So I'll make these all pop and then do that. Save Kali. Saved registers. In case we want to use these. And this will be restore. Kali saved registers. Okay. And we'll put these in reverse order. 12 BP SP RBX. And we'll see if this works. Just so far. Without error. Okay. No errors so far, so I think we're good to go. So for these programs here, I like, if I'm going to use string operations for RSI or RDI, I like to clear the direction flag just so I'm sure that RDI and RSI will increment, you know? So 
and other reasons, but the direction flag and the flags register, we're going to clear. We're going to set that bit to zero. So that RDI and RSI increment in case we want to use like a scan or a load or something. And it should still run. I think GCC will see that and make it work through the assembler. Yeah, it's still all right. So for the System 5 x86 AVI, AMD64 rather, the first argument, here we go. The first argument for an integer or a pointer is going to be an RDI. The second argument is going to be an RSI, RDX, so on and so forth. So for this case, I have a character pointer S and T. These are both pointer arguments. The first one S, second one T. So the first arg, character pointer S, is going to be an RDI. The second one, T, is going to be an RSI. So we can just assume those are set when the function is entered here. For system 5, AMD 64 API. So what I'm going to do is first get the length of the string that we're checking, which is for parentheses, the actual problem here. <laughs> I'm going to get the string length so I know how far to iterate through the string for. So I'll do that first. And I don't need to put a label, but I can put it anyway. And what I'm going to do for this is, actually I do need a label because I think I'm going to do a loop for this, but I'm going to use scan string byte, which will be the equivalent of comparing AL to the data at RDI and then incrementing RDI. I don't think the accumulator is guaranteed to be zeroed out at this point, so I'll do that here. Let's do this, will scan string for null terminator. So initialize to zero, okay. So I'm going to be doing the equivalent of these two instructions here, which will set the zero flag according to whether a zero was found or not. So if the data at RDI, the data at the string, if the character in the string is zero, the null terminator, we reach the end of the string. If it hasn't reached the end of the string, we know we have more characters to check. So we can do that and say if we did reach it, we found the zero, then we can go on somewhere and I'll have a label called like check length. I'll make that. Otherwise, we're not at the end of the string yet. We need to keep going. So I'm going to increment some register here, something to hold a count of the string length. I'm going to use CX. That's traditionally a counter register. So I'm going to ensure that that is set up here as well. This will be string length count. And then if we still have more stuff to go to, I will jump back to the label that we set. So jump back to get string length. Okay, then we go on, we'll have a check length label down here. So assuming we got the string length, this will go down all right. Go down here. I'm going to change the function signature right quick. Just to check what we get as a result from this. So I will do that new line and we'll have the results. Make an int just for a sanity check here. And I'm just going to return true for all these. So it has a value. Um, but to get the length here, I'm going to move RCX into RAX right here. So move into RAX, RCX, and we'll do that. That'll be the return value. Ultimately an integer return value is going to be an RAX just from the calling convention. So that's how I know this stuff will work. And string length for this is two, for the second one is six, the third one is two. And we'll just make a, a wacky one. That should be five as the length. Just to ensure I can add a test case. But yeah, we're good there. Okay, good so far. So why do I want to check the length of these strings? Well, to have a balanced string for these parentheses, it has to be an opening followed by a closed paren in the right position. We can only have an open and a close that match. We can't have an open that doesn't have a corresponding close or vice versa for these parentheses and brackets and braces. If there's no two characters that are going to match to open and close, or in other words, if the string length is not even, if it's odd, then there would be, you know, one too many open parens or one too many closed parens, the string is not balanced. So that'll be false. I don't know if we get any of those in the test cases that they run this function, this program against, but in case they do, I'll just have that check here. 
So a way to do that, uh, just one way, is to test the length. So really we can just test if it's odd by seeing if the first bit, bit zero, is set or not, because all odd numbers will have the first bit set to one. So if I just test the byte CL, since the whole RCX register I'm using to calculate the string length, if bit one is set, then bit one of CL is set because that's the lowest byte value of RCX. Uh, we can do that here. And what test will do, the test instruction does an AND, a bitwise AND between the operands from the register and an immediate in this case. And it just does not overwrite the destination. So we're gonna AND the value in CL with one, which we'll see if bit one is set. So if CL is something like this, we're gonna AND that with one, should be equivalent of like doing that say, and if the first bit is set, then we'll get one. If the first bit is not set, the result will be zero. So that's what we're gonna check against. It will set the flags register. So if it is one, it will not be zero. So we can jump if not zero to say that we have a false condition. So I'm gonna have a label called return false to signify the false condition. Um, the only reason I do indentation like this as an aside is just so I can know that this is in between a loop and this is under a label. Other than that, I don't know. Some people uh, put labels out to the side. That's all just personal subjective preference. Uh, let's have a return false label down here. So return false, I'm going to just XOR RAX, set it to zero. Uh, so return value zero, false. And I'll make this into a bool again, so we can do that. Okay, but if we have a return false, I'll have a corresponding return true as well. And I can put that below here, it doesn't really matter. As long as we have an end condition, I can just jump over the other label. So I'll put that in. We jump to return false sometime. We don't want to do return true, so we'll need to sort of skip over that. So this is not the best code, by the way. It's not going to be branchless or anything, or, or maybe even the top performing. Definitely not, but this is just one example that should work. I can test if it works so far. And by works, I mean runs and doesn't give an error at runtime. So yeah, that seems to be all right. Okay, so to return true, it's just basically nodding if you return false. It's not false would be true, but in this case I'm going to have return true be 1. Instead of any other value that's not 0, I'll return 1 explicitly. So we can just XOR RAX regardless, and we can increment it to return true. So this will be 1 or true. So if the length checks out, the length is not odd, I want to check the string to see if it's balanced, so I'll do that here. And we'll do that by comparing whatever character is in the string against the opening paren. And if, there's, if it's not an opening parenthesis or brace or bracket, I'm going to see if the last thing we encountered is going to be, or the current character that we're on, rather, is going to be the closed sort of matching bracket or brace or parenthesis. So my algorithm is going to say, you know, is, is the character, is the current character in the string you know, this, the opening. I don't like that it auto-completes those every time. That's all right. Is it the opening parenthesis? If so, I'm going to have a stack or a queue or something to uh, push the closing value on. So push closing value to stack, we'll say. And if not, we'll have else. Else if it's an opening bracket, we'll push the closing bracket. Else if it's the opening brace, we'll push the closing brace. Else if it's none of these, then we know we're not opening something, we should be closing something. So I need to check if, it's, if it matches the last thing that was opened. Because if it doesn't, it will not be balanced string. So like these, we're closing the one we opened. We're closing the one we opened in the second example before opening a new one and closing it. And if we close something that isn't the corresponding last thing that was opened, it'll be false and be unbalanced. So I'll do else. 
for this logic, and I'll do otherwise. Check if character matches last opening. If it does, go on. If not, return false. That'll be my sort of basic algorithm here. So how do I compare these things? I need to walk through the string to compare. So we need something set back to the beginning of this first string that was passed in with RDI. I can still walk through RDI again or save things in registers or what have you. So I can do that, that's fine. And um, I'll do that before we check the string. So I'll put here, we will subtract from RDI, the RCX value, the string length. So if we're at the end of the string, we'll subtract the length to get to the start of the string. So RDI equals, oh, well, it'll be one past, sort of, start of the string. And that will be because we're using scan, and scan increments RDI by default. So even if the first character in the string is null, if it's an empty string, RDI will still be will still have one added to it. It'll still be incremented past the first character, even if the first one is a null. So by default, RDI is gonna be one off. So we need to catch that and get the actual start of the string again. So I'm just gonna decrement it again. So yeah, decrement or subtract one to get actual start string, okay. So normally I would want to use string ops, like load string byte, but since I have SI pointing to T, I can't really do that. I could swap RDI and RSI, and that might actually make this easier to work with the algorithm that I'm going to do. So this is just an example. You could subtract, and then you could um, compare the value. You could move the string value into AL to compare stuff against, So, or you can compare directly against the data in RDI. But I think it makes a little bit more sense if we move, say we move the data into AL, and then we compare, I'm not doing this in a string because I'm going to change it in a second, but then we compare against the opening brace, and then we do code or compare against the bracket, the left brace, and so on. So we could do that. Or with string ops, it makes it a little better, a little more sort of semantic or idiomatic for x86 or AMD64 assembly. So I think I'm going to do that. Um, here where we're doing register setup, I'm going to use exchange and exchange RDI with RSI. And what this, would, what this should do is swap, swap these registers. So that'll work. So RDI will point to character T and RSI will point to character S. Or what I could do is just save the value of one and restore it later. So that is fine as well, because scan works well for this. So maybe I don't want to do that right now. I'm going to save the value. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm going to save the value off. Um, we do have to save R12 to R15, but ones below that are fair game. So I'm just going to save into R8, the value at RDI. So we'll save character pointer S, address. I'll do that, because then when I scan everything back and I want to sort of do this stuff down here in a better way. I won't have to get the length again. I can just move back into RDI the value at R8. And that will restore character S address to RDI. I guess if we saved it off, we're kind of restoring it. So normally this, this is also the case here. So I'll put this there. Okay, so after restoring the character pointer S address to RDI here for the string, I'm going I am going to do the exchange between RDI and RSI, the swap. And what that's going to do, yeah, set RDI to T and RSI to S. And the reason I want to do that is because I want to store my character inside of T that I'm going to be comparing against. If I need to store something to compare against later, like storing the, the close for the open, say, and if I want to read a character in automatically with a string operation, I need to use RSI for that. If I want to use like load string by it. So that's why I'm going to do this. I'm going to read from RSI and store to RDI, source and in destination index registers. So that's sort of the semantic way to do things. So I'm going to do that here. Our input string, ultimately, character pointer S, I'm going to read from. So we'll take the next byte from there. So AL is the next character of string. 
S. So I'm going to compare it. Compare it against the left paren. If it's not the left paren, we'll go on. So I'll say if it's not equal, we'll go on to check if it's a bracket or not. Otherwise, it is a left parenthesis, so I'm going to sort of push. But I won't be using push because that's using RSP, and I'm not messing with that. Well, what I, could, what I could do is just do this. I'll move the corresponding close parenthesis into AL, and then I will store string bytes. We will do that. That's just one way to do this. You could also move directly into RDI instead of doing these two lines. You could directly move um, into RDI the closing paren, but then to move to the next spot within that sort of zeroed out array, you'd still have to increment RDI. So it's going to be sort of two lines either way if you do it like this, but I'm doing this. We'll say push closing paren to, uh, to the stack. I'm putting these in, in quotes because they're not really stacks and it's not really pushing, but it's close enough. But else I want to check if it's a bracket or a brace. So I'll check if it's a bracket here. And we'll do similar code, but just for the left bracket. And if it is a left bracket, I'll push the corresponding closing right bracket. If it's not, we'll see if it is a brace or not. That'll store to RDI. I guess I can put that. So what this does is move into RDI AL and then increments RDI. That's what store string byte does. Load string byte does move AL the data at RSI and then increments RSI. And store string byte moves into RDI the data at AL and increments RDI. So they're, you know, they're. Two sides of the same coin there, on purpose. They're source and destination index registers. So that's what they're going to be used for. So if we want to check the brace here, though, we'll see if we have a left brace and we'll push the right brace. Now, I was getting errors with this while testing because for whatever reason, this version that of GCC they're using or the setup that they're using for compiling or, and whatnot thinks that I'm trying to make a nested assembly statement or dialect or something, so this should give an error, I believe. For the left brace specifically, yeah. Well, I have junk after an expression, because I'm probably missing new lines somewhere, yeah. Let me do that. So I think I'll get a different error. Well, that time, the time limit exceeded, because I'm not doing stuff correctly, but... <laughs> That's all right, uh, because this has check brace, so this is an infinite loop right now. Let me make another statement here, another label. We'll check the stack. We'll see if the right character is going to be on, on top of the stack here. We'll have that, and then I'm going to have... Actually, below these, I'm going to finish my thought in a second. I'm just <laughs> trying to think of how to lay this out. If we are pushing the closing version of the opening parenthesis or bracket or brace on the stack, I'm going to move and go to the next character in the string. So that's what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to have a label called next down here as well. And next is just going to loop back up to check string to get the next character in the string. Otherwise, we'll go down here and if we got through the whole string okay, I'm going to say that we got through the string all right, and it's balanced, so we'll, re we'll return true at this point down here. So I'll just have jump return true. That should be all right. That I meant to put new line, not this. Assume got through string okay. It is balanced. All right, so I'm just doing that so we can have next statements here. Otherwise, we do this stuff. I'm just trying to see if it compiles and runs and gives me the error that I wanted. Missing operand zero assumed. Now, that is interesting. Unsupported instruction jump. That's not good either. <laughs> oh, jump next doesn't have a new line. It'll give you cryptic messages. I don't recommend, you know, doing leak code this way necessarily. And it did run, which is interesting.
Before, when I was trying it, this left bracket did not work, and I had to put in a literal, a literal 123 so that it did work. But I think during this, it will be all right, so I will do that. Um, if it works all right with this, we'll just do the left, the left brace, not the left bracket. Because it seemed to work there. Okay, but if, you're, if you get some weird error that says like a nested assembly dialect isn't allowed, it, it has to do with this left brace, because I was getting that before. So if that happens, you can replace this with a, one, with a 123 and it'll work the same. Or whatever numeric literal you want to stand in place of the left brace. Sort of ASCII or 7-bit Unicode range there. Um, but okay, let's assume we got through all these things all right. We're going to check the stack to see if the closing parenthesis, which is what we should be on in the string, matches the last opening parenthesis or bracket that we encountered. So I'll do that here. So there's not really a good way to check, actually, if we're at the start of the string or not. So that's something I forgot to add in. So I'm going to do that here under check, right before check string. I'm going to use RBX, which is okay because we're pushing and popping it. So I'm going to have this as a sort of stack position, save the top of the stack, wherever that may be. But we'll say this is the stack position. Initialize that to zero. Whenever we push something on the stack, like we're doing here, I'm going to increment RBX, say we're at the next stack position. So you go to next stack position. I'll put that in all of these. I guess I put that after the store, didn't I? Okay, so then what we can do in, to check the stack is sort of pop the last value from the top of the stack, so I'll do that. So instead of using pop, I will decrement RBX. So pop top value from stack, which isn't a stack, it's a string, but you know, that's what I'm kind of emulating with the buffer. So that way, since decrement also sets the flags register, we can check if we're before the beginning of the string, or another way to put that is, is the stack empty? Have we gone past the start of where we're storing things? Because that would mean we have too many closing parentheses and not en enough openings, or we just have enough characters that aren't the open parens that shouldn't be in the string for it to be balanced. So I can check if it's below zero or if it's less than zero, signed comparison. Um, unsigned would be below, but we're checking. I'm going to check less than for a signed comparison. And we will return false in that case because our string is not balanced. If moved before start of string or start of the stack, string is unbalanced. Otherwise, I want to compare the value that is at the stack with what we currently have. So we're storing things within our DI. So I, I would have to check and also decrement our DI because we store an increment. Yeah, decrement. So again, pop the top value from the stack. This will be sort of a, I'll say that's the same text there. And I can compare the byte at our DI. So I will do that. I'll compare AL, which is what our character is. Actually, it won't be because we got rid of that. Ooh, so this isn't good. Normally, I'd want to just compare it with RDI, though. <laughs> we'll do this. This is still going to be pop. Popped value from stack. We'll say this. Popped value position in stack. That's a better way of saying that. Um, what I could do is decrement RDI and RSI. Maybe... Yeah, because RSI would be incremented every time anyway from load. So RDI in this case would also, yeah, if we stored something, it would also be decremented. So, okay, we'll decrement both and we'll compare the string values. So that's what I'll do. We'll compare stack value with string value. Or stack character with string character. That's fine. So I'll do this. We'll do compare string byte which will increment them both back to where they were. But this will do compare the data at RSI with RDI while comparing bytes, because I did string byte. So compare string byte with bytes, and then it will increment both. This is what would normally happen, but we have one instruction that can sort of compress those into one, because string ops are cool. And um, that'll set the flags register again. So if they are not the same, if our current value in the string is not our corresponding 
close paren for what was last opened, then we have an unbalanced string. So it would be not equal. They would not be equal. And we would return false in that case. If uh, character and string is not, we'll do, does not match. Closing character on stack, string is unbalanced, we'll say. Otherwise, we'll just go on and check the next thing. And if we get through everything, then we'll return true. Otherwise, we'll return false for one of these things. And it should be all right, assuming I got my logic correct, which I probably didn't because I was kind of winging this as I'm going along. But it's not a very long program, which is part of, partly why I chose this. I'm not doing some super hard program that's a thousand lines, but it looks like our runtime's good so far. So let's see. <laughs> Pun intended. I did do this before. Oh, but okay, we got the wrong answer. Good. <laughs> I did do this slightly differently from this this time that I did it. So, and this mainly this here, 421, is all just me messing with inline assembly. So this test case is wrong. We discovered this, and we're closing. I encountered the left brace. I should have pushed the right brace. Incremented RBX. And then I should have pushed the right bracket and incremented. We decrement, we're not at the beginning because RBX will be two, so we decrement, it'll be one. We're not less than zero. I decrement RDI, which is right. Decrement RSI, because it would have been incremented, so that should be right. So now I have to debug my code, and that's always fun. I'm gonna do that. Okay, so just a small simple mistake, which you always make in C, or in this case inline assembly, even more so when it's hard to debug these things, but since I'm I'm decrementing the strings here and comparing their values, right? If the last thing on the stack is the current thing in the string and the values match, then we're closing the corresponding opening paren and we're balanced or not. If we're not balanced, we return false. So if we are balanced, so on, so far, uh, this compare still implicitly increments RSI and RDI, which means the stack value we just compared against goes back up. And we want to keep going down the stack to deplete it um, to correspond with the things that were pushed on the stack for the opening parentheses and, and braces and things. So to go back and make it right, to counteract this compare incrementing RDI, we have to decrement RDI again to get back to the right position on the stack. So that was the only thing. It was one instruction that messed it up, or one instruction that I left out. But the logic was sound other than that. Um, the only other thing is I didn't explain the loop instruction, and that is uh, RCX, or ECX, or CX, is going to, or CL, <laughs> is basically going to be decremented when this loop instruction is ran. And if we are above zero, it will jump back up to wherever the label is, or the address, that you're looping to. So if I say loop check string, RCX is going to be decremented. If it's not zero, it's going to jump the check string. When RCX is zero, we're going to go on to the next instruction, which in this case is return true because we checked everything in the string. So the, way, the reason that works is because we set up RCX to be the string length before. So to loop through the whole string, we're looping through each character up until the length. So we're decrementing for each character we check against, and RCX will be zero after we're decremented and checked all the characters. So that's why this goes on and this works from this loop instruction. So you do have loops, you have comparisons, we have branches. So really, the assembly is a high-level language and it works. <laughs> works the same as C, another high-level language. Tongue-in-cheek, you know. But that works for that test case. So let's see if the code actually does work now to be accepted. And it doesn't. Oh, I gotta debug some more stuff. That's awesome. I really wish I could program. <laughs> That's all right. It's probably another case of um, not decrementing correctly. So if we encounter two of these, we encounter one, we store it, we jump next, we encounter another, we store another, we jump next. And then we're at the end of the string. Oh, that is why. Yes, we reached the end of the string, but we haven't depleted the stack. So what I need to do is check if RBX is zero at this point. So you see, I meant to do this, right? That was the one edge case I didn't consider. We need to check if um, stack is empty. If not, extra opening, extra openings were not closed. And string is unbalanced. 
We can do that. I can just do that easily by comparing RVX with zero, or if you want to save more bytes and not have an eight byte value, well, you could compare BL, but if you don't want to have a one byte value in addition, we could just OR. Although this might be the same if we're just going to compare against BL, they might both be two bytes, but as an instruction in machine code, this OR should be, I think, two bytes. And the reason you can OR, or even AND, but OR will keep the bits set, is that's just one way to check if something is set to zero or not. It'll set the status flags, it'll set the, the flags register bits. So we can jump and say if it's not zero, or not equal, same thing, um, then we'll return false. But this is just a way of doing that. Um, a compare works just the same, it's just you might want to do an OR like with RBX, because that takes up a lot less bytes than comparing even EBX with zero, because this zero will be expanded to the value of the register, to the size of the register. So EBX is 32 bits, this zero would be four bytes. And add it onto this instruction, I think this would be five bytes, depending on your modes and everything. Um, and RBX would be nine bytes, because that's an eight byte value, <laughs> eight byte register. So we can just OR it, which should be two bytes regardless, around two bytes regardless, and We'll jump not zero. I think it'll have a rex prefix because we're using 64 bits, so maybe three bytes, give or take. But uh, yeah, we'll return false if it's not empty, if the stack position, the stack counter is not uh, at zero. And that should give us the correct value for these things. That was the other edge case I did not consider. Uh, but there we go, now we're accepted. Zero millisecond runtime, which is faster than everything. I don't know how they judge these things. Obviously it's randomized to some extent. Memory usage is high, even though these ones got different values. Whatever, I can't get it below that value. So anyway, that's just one example. <laughs> Not the best coding, by the way. You don't need all these to be saved. You could write this differently and better, more performant, I'm sure. Maybe SIMD stuff if you want to detect and get that. This is a basic example of using, in this case, some amount of 64-bit AMD64 assembly, inline assembly, and leet code. So the language is C. You can use assembly on leak code. As far as I know, when I remembered to check, <laughs> I think hacker rank does not have an assembly option. Leak code does not. Binary search I don't think has one either, but you can still do it on here if you, you know, fudge the numbers a bit and do inline assembly. C++ is also an option for inline assembly, but I did C because I'm, you know, a problem child. But yeah, it works. So hopefully I wasn't too boring. Um, this is kind of a clickbait title video, I guess, more so than I usually do, which I feel kind of slimy about that, but I tried to at least explain what I'm doing, so it's not too clickbaity, because I explain stuff, I think. But anyway, hope you liked it. If you didn't, that's fine, too. Um, if you want to see more stuff like this, let me know. If you want to see more inline assembly leak code problems, if you want to suggest something to do, I'm fine with looking into it. I'm not going to promise I'm going to do like some super hard problem that'll take a thousand lines. But I'll look into whatever, and then I can have like I can write it in C, and then write it in inline assembly by translating the C. Um, if that's something you want to see, <laughs> or if there's something else you'd like me to do, then you know I can look into those as well. But regardless, thank you for watching. I appreciate it, and I'll see you on the next one.